Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin. And once again, I have Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and the Open MPI Project. Jeff, thanks for putting this one together. Hey, no problem, Brock. As uh, this one's about MPI, it's something I work with uh, all day, every day. So this is near and dear to my heart. Yeah, so I spend a lot of my time as a sysadmin working with MPI and making it work. And it can sometimes be a crazy beast, but actually I think it makes a lot of people's lives in parallel computing a lot easier. Um, if Jeff, could you give us a little bit of background on MPI once we get started here? But first, I'd like to introduce our two guests. We have Bill Gropp and Rich Graham, both of who sit on the MPI forum with you, Jeff, I understand, and are central to the updates to MPI that are recently coming and in the future. Well, hi, this, I'm Bill Gropp. I am at the University of Illinois now, and I also have an affiliation with the Institute for Advanced Computing Applications and Technologies. I also was at Argonne for 17 years before I moved here about two years ago. Uh, I've been on the MPI forum since the very, very beginning, uh, including the meeting in Minneapolis that really kicked off the forum, as well as the meeting that Ken Kennedy called before that, that inspired a group of us to form the MPI forum. And most recently, I've been responsible as chair of the effort that produced the MPI 2.2 document. And my name is Rich Graham. I'm at uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, in the Computer Science and Mathematics Division. I run a, a group here who's, who does uh, work on MPI and tools. Um, I've been at Oak Ridge for roughly three years. Before that, spent about eight years at uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory, um, doing a variety of things, including uh, including uh, a lot of work on MPI. Uh, actually, that's where Jeff Squires and myself met when we together started the Open MPI project. Um, in the context of the MPI forum. Um, this is my first uh, first forum to be involved with. Uh, I'm chairing chairing this this effort. Yeah. So as as Rich mentioned here, uh, all all three of us really have been working together for for quite a long time. Um, Bill has uh, quite a large part to do with the MPICH implementation as well. And so <laughs> this interview is going to be a little strange for me because I am actually quite familiar with and work with these guys quite a bit. So I'll just try and keep my mouth shut and ask properly leading questions and things like that. But let's, uh, let's go ahead and start and get at least a little bit of background because every time uh, I, I talk to end users and system administrators and, and most recently at uh, Supercomputing 09 in uh, Portland, Oregon, it, it still amazes me how many people don't really know what MPI is. They know that it's, you know, something used in parallel computing and then it's, you know, a lot of applications use it and things, but they don't really know what it is. So, um, you know, Bill Rich, I wonder if you guys could give us the, the short rundown. You know, what does MPI stand for? What is it? And so on. Well, Jeff, the MPI is the message passing interface. It is a standard specification for a library that allows processes to communicate with each other. Um, it was developed by a diverse group of vendors, users, uh, and researchers to standardize what was a fairly well understood but very fragmented programming model of essentially passing messages between processes. Uh, and the standard uh, is a little schizophrenic in that um, its target is sort of everybody. There's material in the standard for end users, there's material in the standard for tool developers, and there's material in the standard for library developers. Uh, in fact, one of its strengths has been its support for the uh, development of component uh, software, which has allowed people to build applications from libraries written uh, at other places. Uh, so, Richard, I wonder if you could give us a little bit behind the history and the intent behind MPI. Like, for example, I, I know this is the first forum that you've been involved with, and, and Bill's been involved from the beginning. I got involved around MPI 2.0. But, you know, who, who's the target audience? What's it for? You know, how do you see people using it and, and things like that? Because you've been around MPI for years and years and years. So, as Bill alluded to, uh, the, the MPI standard uh, – first became standard roughly 13 years ago, I think it was, 13, 14 years ago. 
um, and really intended in, intended to uh, to bring together uh, to to bring to bring to bear a single a single form of, of message passing that, that that would be supported across by by all or by a wide range of of uh, hardware vendors, so that application developers and uh, tool writers and um, library developers could could rely on on writing a single a single implementation that that uh, they could have a high confidence that would work on, on all the platforms that they care care about and so really the intent the intent behind behind the effort was uh, as as with any standard effort is to uh, is to make is to put together a, a standard that's that's good across and is and and work has the potential to work well across a wide the, a, a wide range of, of hardware and software platforms. So who exactly is responsible for the MPI standards document and, and what, what has gone on there? So we, we've talked about we have MPI 2.2 and MPI 3.0 is in the works and so on, but what, what exactly is the process there? Well, there's a, a, a forum. This is a group of individuals that represent organizations uh, that meet um, about every six to eight weeks. Uh, in the original MPI forum, we met every six weeks. Now we're meeting about every two months. The, the forum uh, is made up of people with um, expertise and interest in various areas of parallel computing in the technical space. And the forum is responsible for uh, producing a document. There is a organized uh, process for voting in sections that's very deliberative. Uh, we followed, in fact, the exact process that was used for high performance Fortran. In fact, in the original MPI forum, we even used the same hotel in uh, northern Dallas, which was a great place to encourage people to stick around and work out the standard. And this process of producing uh, written documents which are then discussed and then read and at consecutive meetings voted on uh, with one vote per organization uh, produces a process that by and large has created a fairly robust uh, document that uh, has had surprisingly few uh, inconsistencies or flaws, and not that it doesn't have any, but uh, it's turned out to be quite uh, quite effective. Um, in fact, the uh, MPI-1 document is now, I think, about 17, 16 or 17 years old um, and has uh, still been a pretty good document um, in terms of defining what MPI should be. MPI is you mentioned what it was used for and such, but uh, I did not get any uh, information in there about what its um, dominance is. Is it is it a really popular use in scientific computing, or is it not that common? Um, what are some of the would call a competitor to it? So, I would say there's essentially no competitor to it in scientific computing at the largest scale and on distributed memory platforms. For uh, shared memory platforms, uh, the primary competitor is probably OpenMP. And then uh, there are various uh, other uh, systems that have been produced either by individual vendors or research groups that have some um, smaller following, um, smaller, possibly very passionate. There certainly are things that some of these systems are better at it than MPI, but if you look at uh, publications in parallel computing, you'll find that if they're using more than a handful of nodes um, and anything besides the most uh, embarrassingly parallel computations, they're probably running MPI. So in terms of the actual standards document, do you actually have to be like a member of the forum, a pay some support fee or anything like that or can anybody get their hands on this document to know what the true standard says well one of the choices that we made in the original forum uh, was to make it very easy 
for people to get a copy of the document. So in fact, the document's available at the MPI Forum website, just www.mpi-forum.org. And you can get the PDF for the whole document there. There's no fee. Um, in terms of being a member of the forum, uh, membership of the forum is achieved simply by showing up at the meetings and participating in discussions. Once you've been at two consecutive meetings, you can vote. Uh, that is, in fact, quite a commitment of time and effort. So it's not that it's free to be a member of the forum. It's just that the, there is no sort of additional cost that's been good for some. It's a little harder for some others. But in general, it has made it possible for the broadest uh, possible participation. I should mention that that participation is international. So you don't have to be a representative of a U.S. company or organization to belong to the forum. In fact, we have quite a few uh, international members. So for both uh, Bill and Rich, what is your own, how did you originally get pulled into doing MPI? And um, what is your employer's interest in having you guys take such a central role in MPI? Do they have a vested interest? Do, do they need this to work on their platforms? What, you know, why do they want you doing this? Uh, so um, I got involved in MPI roughly uh, 10 years ago um, because of my, my interest in, in high performance uh, communication, user level communication stacks. And, and, the, and the fact that MPI is ubiquitous, you know, it, people, people don't use, uh, application developers in general don't use um, communication stacks that they, they don't have high confidence they are going to be supported across a, a, a wide range of, of platforms. And so if, if I wanted my, you know, since I wanted the work I was doing to be used by, by folks uh, and not just be a, a little experiment, uh, doing it myself uh, that I you know I played around with it was important that it be it, it, that it, the output be in a in a format that would be usable which is MPI <laughs> since it is since since Oak Ridge uh, does uh, does have a large uh, parallel parallel system uh, Jaguar uh, which is which is now number one in the top five hundred it has a vested interest in in making sure that applications can run and run well on on that platform so. So ORNL has a vested interest in supporting uh, efforts to, to improve the standard, uh, and, and that's really why, why, why they're interested in me participating in this process. Well, my interest dates back much further, of course. Um, I, in fact, had developed one of the many message passing portability layers that research groups uh, were forced to come up with because there was no standard uh, as part of my research into scalable numerical methods for solving nonlinear systems of equations, sort of classic technical computing problem. And as a result of uh, my experience with that, in fact, uh, my portability layer had been used in an application which was an early winner of a Gordon Bell Prize. I was very interested in the potential to actually solve this problem uh, in a broad way where there'd be a single uh, portable layer. One of the things that I was most interested in and remain very interested in is ensuring that with this portability we don't give up either performance or scalability because there certainly were other portability layers but none that had the performance that MPI has continued to demonstrate. And so uh, that's why I got involved in MPI from the very beginning, in fact, at that Minneapolis meeting. I committed us, uh, Argonne at the time, to a rolling implementation of MPI, and that implementation, which was based on my portability layer, became MPI CH and made it possible uh, for MPI to be adopted widely by many vendors because there was a open source uh, implementation designed to exploit their own uh, low-level communication layers. Uh, since then, I remain very interested in MPI in a number of areas, and one of the reasons that the University of Illinois is happy that I'm participating in this 
is both in terms of the research that can be conducted into performance and scalability of parallel programming models, including MPI, and in the use of such models in computational science and that um, allows me to plug our big machine. So the University of Illinois will have the National Science Foundation's largest system, which will be a sustained petaflop system called Blue Waters, and it will be running MPI applications on well over 200,000 nodes at a sustained petaflop. And ensuring that that, in fact, can happen uh, is one of the things that we're very interested in here. And we all must pay homage to the top 500. I'm, I'm glad to see you got your both. Both of you got your little bylines in there. <laughs> Excellent. Um, for those of you who don't know, the top 500 is a, is a biannual listing of uh, the fastest 500 machines in the world as according to the LINPAC. That's twice a year, whatever biannual means. I mean twice a year. Um, so here's another question that I get asked sometimes um, internally, even within my own company, um, because we're, we're very Ethernet-centric here at, at Cisco. Why don't people just open sockets? What What is better about MPI? Why? W what was the whole point of this? So sure, scalability and all these things, but can't you just get scalability with sockets? And why would you do something else? So, so I would I would say first of all that sockets sockets aren't uh, as you as uh, aren't available in all systems. Uh, so, you know. So on some on some systems, you know, using sockets isn't an option at all. Uh, but you know, that's probably not the not the answer you were necessarily looking for. But beyond that, the the, the issues uh, the issues really revolve around the, the desire for you know for uh, getting achieving high performance. And so when people spend a lot of money uh, on on very large systems, uh, they want to get performance out of the, they want to get optimal they expect to get optimal performance as good performance as they can out of their out of their network uh, and typically uh, a lot of the high performance networks have uh, uh, much better uh, communication stacks if you use something aside from other than sockets and so uh, MPI lets you lets lets you sort of have your cake and eat it too you can you can you can make your choice and use a socket layer if you want to underneath the covers, but it can also it also provides the uh, has the ability to provide the support for the high performance uh, communication stacks that people would like to take advantage of on these on these uh, high performance systems. Yeah, let me add a little to that. Um, one of the things is that uh, sockets defines a fairly rigorous semantics. Uh, including a uh, typically uh, an ordered delivery semantic, which is uh, which requires certain extra overhead on some of these networks, and so there are things uh, performance advantages that we can uh, achieve in MPI that are not available um, with just sockets. Another way to look at that is a, a very good MPI implementation on a high-performance network can achieve latencies uh, on the order of um, one or two microseconds for delivering a message. Uh, that's hard to achieve, um, although not impossible, with sockets. And that's, that's one to two microseconds between two different servers. Right. That's exactly. Um, the time between processes on a single server for MPI uh, is more like a few hundred nanoseconds. And uh, so you're down to uh, the cost of a few memory transactions. The other thing that's important to remember is that MPI contains more than just the point-to-point -point or sort of two-party messaging primitives. A large part of MPI are the collective operations which involve uh, collections of processes performing broadcasts or scatters or collective computation like an all reduce. And again, on the large scalable machines, you will find that hardware has been created to make those operations perform much more efficiently than you can get by gluing them together out of pairwise uh, message passing transactions. So MPI provides a clean way to access those sorts of resources. 
and that's just not present in most other communication models. Uh, I should mention this is a, it's a very different model than the sort of multicast model that um, you might think of. Uh, it's both reliable and uh, very importantly for technical computation. It includes these collective computation operations such as uh, all reduce. Okay, so you're able to optimize under the covers more, um, and the MPI implementer or vendor can worry about, you know, integrating these things together more than the application developer has to worry about them. Exactly. So uh, I have a quick question before we continue. Earlier, you said MPI CH. I guess you can put this to rest for me. It's MPI CH, not MPITCH. Um, yes, it even says that in. The, I think the second edition of using MPI, um, but we don't really care. If you want to call it MPIG, that's okay. okay. It's kind of well. like you know whether there's a, a space in the name of Open MPI or not. Some people don't, <laughs> but you know I do, and Bill will always call it MPI CH, and I frequently call it MPIG. You know, hear it both ways. <laughs> well, I, I I like to respect the you know the creator's effort and what they want to call it. They can call it that. So uh, moving on with something else, what is MPI bad at? What is cases where you've seen somebody use MPI that you're just like, oh my gosh, they should have totally used XYZ. This is an awful use of MPI. That's, that's sort of a loaded question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Perhaps just a little. <laughs> yeah. I well, mean, uh, so, I mean, one of the things, so, so uh, you know, one of the things that's, that's uh, at, han at handling un unpredictable uh, message message traffic, uh, and what I mean by that, uh, it, it can be relatively expensive if you if you if you both in terms of resources that you potentially use as well as in, in performance, if you don't know where where communications are coming from. Uh, having said that, uh, MPI does have the ability to do remote memory operations, which which sort of gets around that issue. But again, there the issue is a lot of a lot of at least part of the issue is are, is uh, performance and uh, our implementation issues. Uh, yeah, another another place where um, MPI is uh, probably not the right choice are are those embarrassingly parallel applications, particularly ones in uh, fault rich environments that are better done with sockets. So if you want to do SETI at home, I would advise you not to use MPI, even though it would be possible um, to build one with uh, MPI, and there's actually some cool things you could do, you really would be much better off using sockets for something like that. The other place where MPI is sometimes not the best choice is within a, an SMP where there are other uh, programming models like OpenMP. Having said that, um, to get good performance out of models on SMPs, you still need to manage locality, and this is something that MPI gives you, or actually forces you to confront, whereas some other programming models attempt to hide it from you, uh, which unfortunately doesn't meet the level of technology we have for dealing with the performance consequences of that. Okay, those are all uh, fair answers. Appreciate that. Let's, let's move on to a slightly different topic here. What uh, was the intent and the goals behind the MPI 2.1 and MPI 2.2 specs that were uh, just recently passed. Because for a little bit of history here for the listeners, MPI 2 was passed way back in uh, 1996, 97, somewhere in that time frame. And there was very little in terms of standards development until uh, just uh, two years ago or so when we kind of got the band back together again and got the forum together and started uh, cleaning things up. Could you tell me... Bill, since you were the chair of 2.2, you know, what was the scope and the intent of 2.1 uh, and 2.2? Well, the, the scope of 2.1 and 2.2 were really to clean up the standard, and in, particularly in the case of 2.2, uh, with the potential of adding a small number of routines that were felt to require modest implementation efforts and provide significant benefit for users. Uh, the biggest thing that happened with 2.1 was to take the MPI 1.1 uh, document, uh, which was a single document, and the MPI 2 document, which included an MPI 1.2 uh, addendum, 
and merge those into a single document. That was a significant effort, in part because there are parts of, for example, the MPI 1.2, which uh, provided significant clarifications uh, or resolutions of ambiguities, of stuff that was in the 1.1 document. Uh, we would get um, comments from people who said, well, MPI says this, and we would have to point out, well, actually in the 1.2 document it says this, or in one of the past errata, so I should mention that the MPI forum had been uh, passing uh, errata, again, with a fairly deliberate process. So there was a, a, an additional set of documents that had to be consulted if you wanted to answer a question, you know, is this valid MPI? So the 2.1 document was primarily that merge along with various corrections that were found as that merge was putting to, was being put together and Rolf Robbins Eichner deserves a tremendous amount of credit for uh, the effort that went into this along with a number of other people uh, that uh, uh, helped uh, resolve each of the chapters. The MPI 2.2 effort then built on this and actually looked at uh, as I mentioned adding a few routines that were felt to be uh, uh, needed uh, fairly urgently by some applications. And so in MPI 2.2, we ended up with a handful of new routines, um, primarily routines to let uh, tool builders um, build better collectives and to provide a better way to dis uh, describe non-Cartesian process topologies in a scalable way. Um, as well as uh, deprecating the C++ interface, which was one of the pieces of MPI 2, which did not seem to uh, catch on with very many users. I, I think someone here in the interview might have been a, a, a big proponent of deprecating those. <laughs> no names mentioned, but his name rhymes with Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> So, Bill, was there any any other scope in in uh, two two? You know, two things that uh, you know people say to me, well, like, well, why should I bother to upgrade my my application, or should I bother to reprint out this monster document? You know, with two two, um, what what else? There um, there were a number of ambiguities that were resolved. So, there's some places where um, uh, an implementation could conceivably have done one of several things, and that's um, no longer the, the, the case in as many um, places. Um, there are, um, uh, let's see. Um, well, the fact were, that you're struggling to come up with stuff is actually yeah. good. I mean, that's kind of a, a testament to what you said before, that the spec actually was pretty tight for 10-plus yeah. years. And it, it took us 10 years to come up with, you know, enough stuff to make it worthwhile for everybody to get back together and, and clarify things. Yeah, I would really say, there, for most people, if you're comfortable with your MPI program, then you don't really need to get the 2.2 document. If you've got questions about the MPI standard or there are things that you're um, unclear about, then I would go first to the 2.2 document because it does have a lot of these clarifications. Maybe the, the leading question here is um, a uh, correct MPI 2.1, or in fact a correct MPI 2.0 program, is still a correct MPI 2.2 program. So if you have a correct program, and it really is correct as opposed to it runs with somebody's implementation now, which might res uh, rely on some uh, interpretation that's um, a resolution of an ambiguity, um, but if it's a correct MPI 2 program, it's still a correct MPI 2.2 program. So moving on from 2.2, since that document's actually out, uh, I've heard Rumblings 3 is in, in works. It's We're not sitting around for another 10 years. Uh, there's actually a 3.0 document coming. Yeah, so uh, the 3.0 the 3 effort uh, actually did start... Um, roughly about the same time we started uh, working on the 2.1 document, though though uh, not in not in as much earnest as it's as it as we are now, um, since we can you know basically any effort that we put towards the standard is really now directed towards 3.0 because everything's behind us. So 3.0 is a lot more ambitious in terms of what potentially, and I have to emphasize potentially, 
uh, can go into the standard. Uh, in in 3.0, uh, issues such as backward compatibility uh, were, were thrown open for discussion to try and understand uh, uh, you know, where, where, where it makes sense to maintain backward compatibility and where it does not. Uh, for 3.0, you know, the, the, uh, the door was also open for adding uh, you know, completely new functionality to the standard, taking away completely uh, a functionality that, was, that is viewed as, as maybe not necessary. Uh, and there, I'll mention Jeff's Jeff's uh, favorite topic are the C plus plus bindings. Get rid of them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but the door the door is wide uh, is wide open. But having said that, uh, you know since this is a standard, uh, you know things we can't just be you know we can't just do whatever we feel like. Uh, and uh, so the several several rules that that, uh, that we do we do follow is first of all. This still is the MPI standard, uh, so this isn't this isn't the kitchen sink of, of parallel programming. This isn't uh, uh, you know some other. I mean, the the intent is still to is still to uh, to continue and support uh, app, um, primarily uh, application and library developers. Although there has been some discussion about what might might be done to help support com- to help support compilers. Um, also, because this is a standards effort, there, there's a uh, there's a wide range of uh, a wide range of things that can go into the standard, and and to and to become part of the standard, you have to have at least 50 percent of the uh, of the uh, voting members agree agree with you on on two different two v- different votes and the final vote on the whole on the whole uh, uh, document that the, this is something that should go into the standard. So there is a fair amount of work to actually uh, and. Uh, and a fair amount of process in place to make sure that that what happens uh, is 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 uh, is not uh, doesn't happen on a whim and, and and there's deliberate time delays in the whole process to give people time to think about uh, about what goes into the standard. Having having given that huge caveat, um, there are several several items that are that are currently. Uh, under discussion, there have been quite a few items that have been proposed. A lot of a lot of them have sort of died on the vine, um, but those that are that are people are currently working on um, and uh, and are, are making active progress is first of all collective communications uh, and, and topology, topologies. This is a, a this is the uh, the one part of the standard of the of the three O standard that actually has already uh, has already already has something that's made it into the initial has gone through the first first cut of, of voting on the standard and that's the non blocking collectives. Um, that effort was chaired by by Torsten and still is chaired by Torsten Hofler from Indiana University. Um, there's a, a group looking at uh, looking at fault tolerance and and trying to understand uh, what and if and what it make what, what might be added to to the MPI standard to support fault tolerance? Uh, there's there's a, there's a group that's looking at at uh, how to improve uh, Fortran Fortran binding support in the standard to take advantage of of some of the new capabilities that have, that the that Fortran has introduced. Uh, this is actually a good example where where the Fort, uh, Fortran standards committee and the open and the MPI Standards Committee are working together to try and to try and and do something together that's better for the users. Um, uh, Bill is chairing the, the the section that's that's uh, looking at what to do about remote memory accesses. There's uh, there's uh, a general feeling that that remote memory accesses uh, access support in, in MPI 2.2 isn't quite what people would like it to be. Whatever that happens to mean. Uh, and and that that effort is trying to see you know what it makes sense you know what what changes might be made uh, there to to improve or to, to change uh, hopefully improve uh, support. There's a very active group looking at uh, what what sort of capabilities should be added so that tools can better support MPI implementations. Uh, sort of to to add uh, things, some of the things, or one specific thing that's been been uh, looked at is is uh, how how to how to better support 
uh, process acquisition so that debuggers and other tools can, can have a standard way that they can be sure that a standard compliant MPI supports uh, to, to uh, gain uh, process information about a parallel job. Uh, and there is, and the last last working group that's that's become very active recently is an active group that's looking at at what MPI should do to play better within the broader the broader uh, community of of uh, of parallel programming. And Bill already suggest already mentioned uh, you know, thread how to interact better with threads potentially specifically. You know, one one of the thread packages being con- considered is is OpenMP. Uh, people have been looking into what makes sense to do in the context of, of GPUs. Just just to name a few things that, that fall under this under this category. So you can see that the list the list is is uh, is somewhat extensive. Uh, what actually makes it into the standard? Hopefully, we'll know within the next year and a half or so. So in terms of uh, a regular you know, user of MPI currently, if they wanted to give you guys input, do they have to email you, get on one of the implementations lists, or are you guys actually feeling out for input from people in the world? So, so, so I'll address that because that's one of the one of the things I do on a on a on a somewhat regular basis. So there's several uh, several ways that you can you can contact us. Several ways that you can provide uh, provide input. Uh, so from my, from my perspective, the the best way to do that is if people want to join us in the process. You know, as Bill said, there's no there there's no fee to join us, although there is a meeting fee because the the meeting the meeting is self is self sustaining. So we have to pay for for whatever whatever facilities we use to meet, uh, which is not it's not a large fee at all. Um, that does require quite a commitment, uh, uh, but it's from my perspective by far the best way uh, to get involved. There are mailing lists. There's a mailing list that's uh, comments at uh, m- list dash mpi dot. Let's scratch that, Jeff. Do you happen to? It's it's comments. I think at, it's mpi dash uh, comments at mpi yeah, dash com- okay. org. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and there's the wiki. Yeah, and the wiki, and we should also plug the uh, survey. I, I have a good comment to make the about the survey. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. But also, you know, we had a, we had a public meeting at, at Supercomputing to uh, to elicit 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 uh, feedback from users. We're planning uh, planning on having a, a, me- a meeting at the super Supercomp- uh, a similar type of meeting at the, at the Supercomputing meeting in in uh, in Germany in in June. Uh, and so we, we try to actively, uh, in as many ways as we can think of, and have time to do to, to elicit information. Because ultimately, the intent is to is to, to provide better service, not to implement our favorite algorithm or whatever. Rich, I'll, I'll throw in too uh, that at that uh, the birds of a feather session at supercomputing about the MPI forum uh, it was pretty well attended, I think, and there was a, a good number of people there, and and there. We introduced a user level survey um, that we're asking people to participate in. Um, that you can go to mpi forum dot question pro dot com. We just used a you know web survey company thingy to do it. And um, so far, you know, since supercomputing, we've had two hundred sixteen replies, and actually the most recent of which came in while we were recording right here. And so this is uh, we have a bunch of questions on that survey where we're really genuinely asking for feedback from the MPI community about, you know, what do you want to see? What do you not want to see? And there's some leading questions and some not so leading questions and some free form areas where, you know, we want to hear what people think. Some of the questions are really complex. And, you know, in some of the questions we even said, Hey, if you don't know, if you're not familiar with this area, please don't even, don't even answer. And that's not meant to be condescending. It's meant to be a recognition that, some of these issues are really fantastically complex, um, so we are looking for you know good, good feedback from people who are familiar with their favorite areas of of MPI. Oh, and I should also point out too that we posted the slides from the uh, Birds of a Feather session. It's on the meetings.mpi-forum.org website. If you go to the November meeting and look uh, look under slides, the the BOF slides are listed there. 
I'll yeah, get just, all those from you guys, and I'll stick them all on the uh, show notes for this uh, show when it goes up on rce-cast.com, and that way people can get the links and they don't have to try to follow what we're saying right now. I was going to add that uh, all the MPI forum mailing lists are, moder- are uh, subscriber only to avoid uh, um, spam. So if if you if people do want to make comments to the uh, MPI dash comments uh, mailing list, please make sure to sign up for the mailing list. Otherwise, it goes it it won't make it out to, to everyone. And I'd like to add that I encourage everyone who's interested to participate. Uh, at the same time, I really encourage everyone to um, take advantage of of the history, of the discussions, and the wiki. As uh, Jeff alluded. Some of these issues are quite subtle. They may seem simple on the surface, but they are uh, can be some very um, interesting uh, issues that you may not think of on first blush. And one of the things that's actually fun in participating in the forum is learning about uh, the sort of bigger world in some of these issues. So I would, again, encourage anyone who's interested to take advantage of the wiki, uh, see what the history, learn what the background is, and to participate. Okay, guys, um, both Bill and Rich, thank you very much for your time. Um, I I learned quite a bit. I I tend to see MPI as a very high-level user perspective and as a sysadmin perspective. I filled out the survey, and I screwed up something, so I actually have to go back and refill out the survey myself, and I haven't done it yet. Uh, We're going to put all those links up on the show notes on rce-cast.com. And thanks a lot, you guys, for your time today. And we'll see that 3.0 document in the future. Thank you. All right, thanks for your time, guys.